Welcome to the Saturday Sex Show. So in case you're not sure that's sect, S-E-C-T. Don't get that confused. Now, I know like what some of you guys like to do on Saturdays, but that's not what we're doing here. We're talking about sex. We're talking about beliefs, organizations, uh, religions, all of the above. Anything you can think of. Now today, we will be talking about the Anunnaki. And as you can see from the thumbnail back there, the Anunnaki to Yahweh. So for a lot of us on this channel, we're, we are ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. Now for the 30 years that I was a Jehovah's Witness, the only time I heard of the Anunnaki was right at the end I think it was about 2011, and I was uh, doing some missionary or uh, unassigned territory work up in the Arctic, and one of my studies up there, we would sit down at night, and he would start playing the movies on the Anunnaki, and in no time, my mind would shut off, and I would go to sleep. <laughs> I couldn't handle it. I, I, I couldn't uh, handle the, the, the movie, like the concept, because I was so watchtower indoctrinated. Now, that was a lot of years ago, 2011. And now, uh, what, uh, 10, 11, 12 years later, here I am talking about this in a, in a reverse role. Because we all know that the watchtower is made up of men. Now, when we get out of the watchtower, one of the questions I have, and perhaps you have, is how do we know that the whole Bible isn't made up by men? Just like the watchtower is made up by the watchtower uh, to promote their narrative. So what the watchtower does is they take the Bible, the book that has been around for a lot of years, thousands perhaps, a couple thousand years, Maybe, maybe a thousand years the Bible's been around. So now, the Bible that we know, perhaps. But the Watchtower takes his book, and they have their own narrative, their own fictional story. So they write all these Watchtower journals and bound volume them over the years. And they built a new Bible. It's a bigger Bible to support their narrative. Now, it's no different. Uh, I think we get out of the Watchtower. It's no different. We look at the Watchtower. We look at how we were kind of sucked in and we believed in this. It was an illusion. We believed in their illusion. And, and so we followed it. We dedicated our life. In fact, some of us gave up our lives. Maybe we didn't take blood transfusions and we're dead. You know, perhaps some of us went to prison when we, we didn't have to. And we had a horrible life over the Watchtower all over an illusion that the Watchtower had presented to us, uh, to me anyways, and I thought it was real. I thought it was truth. So, so I followed it for most of my life. Now on this side of the fence, I want to give you a story. You know, I'm, I'm going to my uh, buddy here, uh, my buddy at the uh, Watchtower Help Club. Here he is. Uh, and we're going to talk about Joe. Now this, this is from the Watchtower Help Club. Um, if you, if you haven't heard of the Watchtower Help Club, the, this is an individual that, um, used to be a Bethel writer. He was in the New York Bethel in the writing committee. And, uh, after writing a 20 page letter to the, uh, the brother that was in charge of the writing committee and explaining how the Watchtower is off track in a lot of areas, uh, he was soon kicked out after three and a half years of being in Bethel. So then he, uh, somewhere along the line, started this block. And he started this just to help a lot of people. He doesn't even want to be known. His name, he's he's uh, chosen to stay behind the scenes. I, I've talked to him on email. And uh, so uh, this article I thought was interesting. This is an article about Joe. And he wrote this in 2011. Uh, he says, let me tell you about the greatest guy I know. And uh, he says, Joe is the greatest because of his integrity. You'll never meet a more ethical and fair-minded, good-hearted guy than Joe. 
So we're going to talk about Joe here for a minute. And by the way, uh, this is a live, uh, so uh, this is a premiere. So we'll have the live chat here on the side. And I will be on the live chat today because this is pre-recorded. So this allows me to uh, take some time and chat with you guys about some of the subjects. And if you have questions now, as we get into the Anunnaki, I know that's going to really grab you for a bit. And, uh, but it's a good opportunity. We can chat and we can talk about some of these things. Now, we're going to carry on and talk about Joe. Now, Joe's the greatest because of his integrity. And you'll never uh, meet a more ethical and fair-minded, good-hearted guy than Joe. Well, let me tell you why I praise Joe so highly. You'll be literally singing his praises, too, once you hear. Well, Joe used to have the most beautiful backyard in the neighborhood replete with fountains and trees and a real orchard. And he always left the gate open. <clears throat> open. He allowed all the neighborhood uh, kids in, the neighborhood kids. And they'd come in and play and they'd eat fruit off of his trees, etc. Well, all except one tree, which he had posted a sign. And Joe said, don't eat from this tree. So violer, he said, violators will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And he says, I know that, uh, or, or I guess the writer here is saying, I know that doesn't sound like Joe. But hey, I guess he really loved that tree. So one day the inevitable happened. He found a couple of kids munching on the fruit from his favorite tree. Well, the kids didn't know it was wrong. They couldn't read. But he threw them and everyone else out of the yard, locked the gate, posted a guard, and then destroyed the orchard. And did I mention that Joe has a violent temper? Yeah, it seems so. Well, those kids, they hadn't acted entirely on their own initiative when they ate the forbidden fruit. No, <clears throat> in the neighborhood, there was a bully and uh, he was jealous of Joe and his name was Stan. Yeah. Well, when Joe burned down the orchard and threw everyone out, he also put Stan in charge of all the kids. Of course, he knew that Stan was a real lowlife and that he'd treat the kids miserably and lead them into all kinds of mischief and he'd lead to their ruin. But hey, they'd chosen Stan over him and Joe was pretty peeved about that. So, so he left her, let them suffer the consequences of their own choice. That's fair, isn't it? But then Joe got to thinking, he'd gone to so much work planting that orchard, he really wanted people to enjoy it. So he decided to murder his own son in order to forgive everyone for what those kids had done. Well, those two kids, it was only two kids that did this. So he murdered his son. But before he had his own son murdered, he told his favorite kids to act out the upcoming murder by ritually killing animals. Wasn't that a great act of love on Joe's part? But before you start singing his praises along with me, I have to tell you that there is still more evidence of his great love and forgiveness for all of humanity. Joe decided to murder all those kids who followed Stan, the guy Joe left in charge and then have the remaining kids plant a new orchard for themselves on a new plot of land that Joe would give to them. Wasn't that generous? Those few kids are going to live happily ever after, thanks to Joe, for the right way of dealing with those original two bad kids. And I know that some people think Joe could have handled this whole situation better somehow. But hey, Joe says he's a lot smarter and better than anyone else, so he knows what's best. Better not to question his actions, or you won't be allowed into that future orchard. Just keep praising him and using his name at least once in every sentence, similar, how, similar to how some people use the F word. Just be sure to use his full name, Joe Hova. <laughs> so, so there you have it <clears throat> there's a story about <clears throat> where am I here there's a story about Joe and uh, Joe and his orchard so there's a picture right there 
so you can see Joel in his uh, in his orchard. So, uh, that was a mistake. <laughs> so now now that we know a little bit about Joe and his orchard, uh, it's easy to, to see the parallel and then we start thinking when we when we read the story like this is how silly the story really is. So um, this got me uh, questioning things. And uh, as I've uh, mentioned on this channel, um, called Fixing My Faith. I started this channel about a year ago and uh, the channel, the design of the channel is to research and to fix my faith, to find out what happened, what, how, how, why did I spend 30 years down a rabbit hole? I come out and I found out it was all one big lie to promote an illusion, an illusion that the Watchtower made real and I believed it. So now that I'm out, I'm reluctant to jump down any rabbit hole again. And so we started these channels and we're examining different, different religions, different sects, different ways of belief. But one of the ways of belief that I have not examined yet until just the other day is this one. And uh, I'm going to pull up my display here. It's the Anunnaki series. And this is a documentary uh, and movies, this channel. You can, you can subscribe to it yourself if this subject interests you. Um, this by far, uh, in my opinion, is one of the best explanations of all of this stuff that I've looked at over the years. And uh, the, on this channel, uh, you can go to the videos and uh, we're going to take a look at the very f latest video that was just put out two days ago and it, and it got 50,000 views two days ago, is from Anunnaki to the Biblical Yahweh. and. Uh, we're, we're going to be playing this whole movie on this channel. We won't be monetizing it because it's the property of, of this ancient mysteries. But I think it's such an important subject that I want to bring it to your attention and let you be the, the decision on this. But uh, I, I thought it was fascinating. And in fact, what my wife and I did, as you can see, you look where all the red marks are. We went back and we watched all of the movies. We started at Anunnaki movie number one, The Lost Book of Enki, tablets one to five. So there's 12 tablets. And, uh, and I do have one of the books, the uh, uh, Stitchin books, Zechariah Stitchin. I have one of them, I think the first one. And uh, then we watched Anunnaki movie two, The Lost Book of Enki, and that's tablets six to nine. We watched The Return of the Anunnaki, What Will Happen, and uh, The Anunnaki Revealed, Are They Fallen Angels of the Bible? No, they are not. Ancient Alien Documentary, Anunnaki, Stitchin. You know, so there's a, there's a few things that we've watched. We went all the way to movie three. And, uh, and then over here, The Trial of God Was He Invented, Judging Yahweh, the God of... What does it say? The God, the God of the Bible. So uh, we watched part of that. So we're, we're into this journey of watching it. I'm going to share this, this very latest video with you as the audience on this channel. And then if you wish, you can subscribe to this other channel and, and watch till your heart, heart's desire. I found it fascinating and I found a lot of parallels to the Bible. In fact, I found this to be like a backstory to what we learned through the through the through the Hebrew Bible, the Bible that the Jews wrote, and uh, and and when we trace Yahweh all of, all the way back, we can see all the gradual changes in history, and uh, and and then. But I'll let you watch the movie here. Um, what else do we have? We're going to get right into the movie here. Here we are, and I'm going to change my display. So. Right on this uh, this movie, I'm going to look at the contents of it here first, and uh, just to give you an idea what's in this this video. Now, these guys, uh, this Anunnaki Ancient Mystery Channel, it was just started in August of 2022, and uh, this is a brand new channel. It's only uh, um, it's not even a year old. It's not even a year old, almost a year old. So they have 39.4 thousand subscribers already. And you can never see the guy. There's no email. I tried to email him. I've sent different messages. And I let him know that I will be promoting their channel. 
So in this video, we embark on a journey to uncover the true identity of Yahweh, the biblical God. This exploration takes us back to the ancient Near East where Yahweh likely originated and raises the possibility that Yahweh could have been influenced or even originated from Anunnaki, a group of deities in the ancient Mesopotamian culture. The Anunnaki, whose names mean those who from heaven to earth came, or those of royal blood, in the ancient Sumerian language, were the deities of the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia, such as the Sumerians, Arcadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. They were believed to be the divine beings who descended to earth to civilize mankind, teach them agriculture, writing, science, and more. The Anunnaki were central to these ancient cultures, much like Yahweh is central to the biblical narrative. The oldest mention of Yahweh was attributed to the Moabite stone, an ancient inscribed stone that dates back to around 840 BCE. This stone created significant excitement as it was the first non-biblical inscription mentioning Yahweh. The inscription tells the story of King Mesha of Moab who revolted against the kingdom of Israel and attributes his victories to the god Chemosh while recognizing Yahweh as the god of his enemies. The connection between Yahweh and the Anunnaki is not a straightforward one. It is a complex web of ancient stories, archaeology, archaeological findings, and theological interpretations. However, the possibility that Yahweh could have been influenced by or even originated from Anunnaki provides a new perspective on the Bible narrative. It suggests that the story of Yahweh and the Israelites is part of a larger narrative that encompasses the ancient Near East and its diverse cultures and religions. The exploration of Yahweh's origin is not just tracing the path of a deity from the ancient Near East to the pages of the Bible. It is also about uncovering a forgotten layer of ancient story that reframes the whole narrative of human beings. If challenges, it challenges us to look beyond the familiar narratives and delve deeper into the rich tapestry of human history and spirituality. In this video, we invite you to this journey of discovery. As we trace the path of Yahweh from Anunnaki to the Bible, we hope to shed light on the complex and fascinating history of this deity and offer a fresh perspective on the biblical narrative. Remember, history is not just about the past. It is also about understanding the present and shaping our future. By exploring the origins of Yahweh, we are not just uncovering ancient stories. We are also gaining insights that can help us to understand our own beliefs and traditions better. So let's dive in and explore the fascinating world of Yahweh and the Anunnaki. <clears throat> so there's the preface, there's the description in this video. And you can also look at the Anunnaki in Wikipedia. There's a link there. So uh, we'll get right into the video and I will disappear off the screen. Okay. So here we go. The Bible, according presents us with a God who seemingly single-handedly in the vast expanse of human history, few questions have captivated our collective curiosity as much as the enigma of the divine. Among the pantheon of gods and deities that have adorned the chronicles of human faith, one name resonates through the ages. Yahweh, the biblical God. But who is Yahweh? This question, simple in its asking, unravels a complex tapestry of theology, history, and human civilization. The Bible, a cornerstone of Abrahamic religions, presents us with a God who seemingly single-handedly orchestrates the creation of the universe, planets, stars, animals, plants, humans, and everything that exists. 
This being is often understood as the one and all-powerful God, the Father of all creation. However, a closer examination reveals a specific proper name recurring throughout the Bible, Yahweh. The name Yahweh, laden with centuries of interpretation and theological discourse, is not just a name, it is a window into the evolution of human understanding of the divine. A testament to our ceaseless quest to comprehend the cosmos and our place within it. It is a name that has been etched into the bedrock of our collective cultural memory, shaping civilizations, influencing cultures, and guiding the course of human history. The exploration of Yahweh is not merely an academic exercise, it is a journey into the heart of human civilization, a quest to unravel the threads of our shared past. It is a voyage that takes us back to the cradle of civilization, to the ancient Near East, where the name Yahweh likely originated. It is here that we begin to uncover a narrative that is as fascinating as it is complex. Interestingly, as we delve into the ancient Near East, we encounter the intriguing possibility that Yahweh could have been influenced or even originated from the Anunnaki, a group of deities in ancient Mesopotamian cultures. The Anunnaki are often associated with creation myths and were revered as gods in Sumerian, Akkadian, Assyrian, and Babylonian traditions. The exploration of these questions uncovers a forgotten layer of ancient story one that reframes the whole narrative of human beginnings. It reveals that hidden in plain sight in the pages of Genesis is an even more ancient narrative, one that has been obscured from the public for centuries by mistaken translation and the dogmas of the Church. As we reach the culmination of our journey, we will seek to answer the question, Who is Yahweh, the Biblical God? The oldest mention of Yahweh was attributed to the Moabite stone, also known as the Mesha Stele. This monumental stone was erected by King Mesha of Moab around 840 BCE to commemorate his triumph over Israel. Inscribed on the stele, Mesha recounts his victory and claims to have taken the sacred objects dedicated to Yahweh the deity revered by the Israelites and offered them to Chemosh, the chief god of Moab. These objects were likely taken from the temple of Yahweh in Samaria, the capital of Israel at that time. Discovered in 1868 in present-day Jordan and published in 1870, the Moabite stone created significant excitement as the first non-biblical inscription mentioning Yahweh. The stele recounted a similar event to the biblical narrative in 2 Kings 3, where Mesha, the Moabite king, rebels against Israel. However, a crucial difference emerged. The stele claimed a victory for Moab, while the Bible maintained that Israel was the triumphant party. The interpretation of the Yahweh reference further reinforced the notion that Yahweh was exclusively the God of the Israelites. Misha boasted of seizing the vessels associated with the Israelite god as tribute to his own god, Chemosh. This view suggested that Yahweh was distinctively worshipped by the Israelites alone. In 1844, the archaeologist Carl Richard Lepsius excavated the ruins of the ancient city of Solib in Nubia, meticulously documenting the site. However, no excavation took place during his investigation. In 1907, James Henry Breasted visited the site but did not engage in any excavation either. It was not until 1957 that a team led by archaeologist Michela Schiff Giorgini conducted extensive excavations at Soleb. During their work, they discovered a reference to a group referred to as the Shasu of Yahweh at the base of one of the temple's columns in the Hypostyle Hall. This temple had been constructed by Amenhotep III, who reigned from 1386 to 1353 BCE. 
The mention of Yahweh in association with the Shasu indicated that this god had been worshipped by another people long before the events described in biblical narratives were believed to have occurred. The Shasu, described by the Egyptians as Semitic nomads, often regarded as outlaws or bandits, were listed among Egypt's adversaries on the temple column at Soleb. Additionally, they were mentioned in an inscription from the reign of Rameses II as enemies of the pharaoh during the Battle of Kadesh. Given the Shasu's nomadic nature, attempts have been made to link them with the Hebrews or the Habiru, a group of dissidents in the Levant. However, these claims have been refuted. The Shasu were not Hebrew, and the Habiru appeared to be Canaanites who resisted conforming to local customs rather than a distinct ethnic group. The discovery of Amenhotep III's reference to the Shasu of Yahweh pushed the origins of this god further back in history than previously believed and also hinted that Yahweh might not have originated from Canaan. This supported the theory that Yahweh was a desert deity adopted by the Hebrews during their exodus from Egypt to Canaan. Some scholars interpreted the descriptions of Yahweh as a pillar of fire at night and a cloud during the day as well as other fire-related imagery in the book of Exodus, as indicative of a storm or weather god. Moreover, Yahweh's ability to guide Moses to water sources, Exodus 17, 6, and Numbers 20, further reinforced the notion of Yahweh as a desert god. Nonetheless, it is widely accepted in modern times that Yahweh initially emerged as a minor deity in the Canaanite pantheon, specifically in southern Canaan, and the Shasu, as nomads, likely adopted the worship of Yahweh during their time in the Levant. Recent scholarship has prompted a reinterpretation of the Moabite stone, revealing that the people of Moab also worshipped Yahweh. Consequently, Mesha's reference to taking the vessels of Yahweh to Chemosh likely meant that he considered them the rightful possessions of the Moabites rather than the spoils of conquering Israel and their God. The word Yahweh is not just a name, but a linguistic artifact, a testament to the times and cultures that birthed it. It's a word that carries with it the echoes of ancient civilizations, their beliefs, their languages, and their understanding of the divine. The name Yahweh, as we've discovered, is deeply rooted in the ancient Semitic languages. It's a name that resonates with the linguistic patterns of the region, patterns that are echoed in the languages of the Canaanites, the Israelites, and the Arabs. The name Yahweh, in its original form, was likely pronounced differently reflecting the phonetic nuances of these ancient tongues. The grammatical structure of Yahweh is intriguing. It's a name that seems to be intrinsically linked to the verb to be. This connection to the verb to be suggests a sense of being, of existence, that is inherent in the name Yahweh. The meaning of the name Yahweh has been interpreted as he who makes that which has been made, or he brings into existence whatever exists, though other interpretations have been offered by many scholars. In the late Middle Ages, Yahweh came to be changed to Jehovah by Christian monks, a name commonly in use today. However, the name Yahweh is not just about existence, it's also about passion, about commitment. The name Yahweh could be derived from the Arabic language, indicating a passion or a commitment of the deity towards his people. This interpretation aligns with the frequent references in the Bible to Yahweh as a jealous God, a God who is passionately committed to his people. The name Yahweh, therefore, is not just a name. It's a declaration of existence, a testament of commitment, a proclamation of divine passion. It's a name that encapsulates the essence of the deity it represents, a deity who is passionately committed to his people, a deity who exists, who is? From being a local deity of the Midianites, a tribe that traced its lineage back to Abraham, Yahweh transformed into the sole deity of the Israelites. This transformation is mirrored in the evolution of the name Yahweh, 
a name that began as a reflection of a local deity's commitment to his tribe and evolved into a declaration of the one true God's existence and commitment to his chosen people. The name of this supreme being was considered too holy to be spoken. As a result, the consonants YHWH were used to remind one to say the word Adonai, Lord, in place of the God's name. This practice of using epithets in referencing a deity was common throughout the Near East. However, the origins of Yahwism remain shrouded in mystery. Even the final edited form of Genesis 2, Kings in the Bible presents diverse views on the matter. Some passages trace the worship of Yahweh back to the earliest days of the human race, while others trace the revelation and worship of Yahweh back to Moses. The character and power of Yahweh were codified following the Babylonian captivity of the 6th century BCE, and the Hebrew scriptures were canonized during the Second Temple period, approximately 515 BCE to 70 CE, to include the concept of a Messiah whom Yahweh would send to the Jewish people to lead and redeem them. Yahweh, as the all-powerful creator, preserver, and redeemer of the universe, was then later developed by the early Christians as their God who had sent his son Jesus as the promised Messiah, and Islam interpreted this same deity as Allah in their belief system. As the Iron Age dawned around 1200 to 930 BCE, the Israelites in Canaan sought to distinguish themselves from their neighbors. In a bid to consolidate political and military strength, they elevated Yahweh above El, the supreme deity, and claimed him as their own. Yahweh's association with the forge and with imagery of fire, smoke, and smiting made him a fitting deity of storms and war. His character transformed from a deity of transformation to one of conquest. El, often referred to as the supreme god in the Canaanite pantheon, was a deity of immense stature and reverence. His influence was widespread, and his name was synonymous with divinity itself. El was the epitome of wisdom, authority, and fatherhood, often depicted as an elderly figure with a flowing beard, seated on a throne. His realm was that of justice, kindness, and compassion, and he was often invoked for blessings of fertility and prosperity. Yahweh, on the other hand, emerged from a more obscure background. Initially a regional deity associated with the wilderness and stormy weather, Yahweh's influence grew over time, eventually permeating the entire Israelite society. His rise was not without contention, but his followers were steadfast, and Yahweh's prominence continued to grow. The relationship between Yahweh and El is a complex one, marked by both conflict and convergence. There are indications that Yahweh was initially considered a lesser deity in the pantheon that included El. However, as Yahweh's influence grew, so did his stature. The lines between the two deities began to blur, leading to a period of syncretism where characteristics and roles were shared or transferred. One of the most intriguing aspects of this relationship is the potential role reversal that occurred. As Yahweh's prominence rose, there are indications that he began to adopt some of the roles and characteristics traditionally associated with El. This is particularly evident in the depiction of Yahweh as a compassionate and just deity, roles that were traditionally associated with El. The convergence of Yahweh and El is also evident in the linguistic analysis of their names and titles. The name El is often used in the Hebrew Bible as a generic term for God, and it is also incorporated into the names of various characters and places, indicating its widespread usage and significance. Similarly, the name Yahweh also appears in various forms. Michael's biggest sale of the summer. This story is extraordinary, especially if it's true. And it all started in the desert, just north of Las Vegas and combinations, further indicating a level of convergence between the two deities. However, this convergence was not without conflict. The rise of Yahweh led to a shift in the religious landscape, with a growing emphasis on monotheism. 
This shift was likely met with resistance from those who adhered to the traditional polytheistic beliefs, leading to a period of religious tension and conflict. Despite these conflicts, the eventual dominance of Yahweh is undeniable. Over time, Yahweh transitioned from a regional deity to the sole god of the Israelites. This transition was not just a simple replacement of one deity with another, but rather a complex process of religious evolution and transformation. This shift is evident in Israel's early poetry and narrative literature, where Yahweh is often portrayed as a militant figure. The Song of the Sea in Exodus 15, 1, 18, and the Song of Deborah in Judges 5 are typical examples, praising Yahweh as the divine warrior who intervenes on behalf of his followers. It's suggested that Yahweh's status as the national god was primarily established in connection with Israel's wars. During times of peace, the tribes would have depended heavily on Baal in his various local forms to ensure fertility. But when they came together to wage war against their common enemies, they would have turned to Yahweh, the divine warrior who could provide victory. The image of Yahweh as warrior is prevalent throughout the Hebrew scriptures, which later became the Christian Old Testament. Warrior imagery is also apparent in passages in the New Testament, which drew on the earlier works. In the early days of Israel, Yahweh was perceived as a warrior storm god, a deity of power and might who was deeply connected to the natural elements. This image of Yahweh was likely influenced by the surrounding Canaanite religions, which also worshipped storm gods. The Israelites, living in a region prone to violent weather phenomena, would naturally gravitate towards a deity that embodied these powerful forces. This practice evolved into worship of deities such as El, Asherah, Baal, Utu Shamash, and Yahweh, among others. In the early days of the Israelites in Canaan, the people practiced a form of ancestor worship, venerating the God of the Father, or the God of the House, in addition to paying homage to their earthly ancestors. However, the worship of Yahweh was not confined to his storm god aspect. As the Israelites interacted with neighboring cultures and their religious practices, Yahweh's image began to evolve. He was increasingly seen as a god of fertility and abundance, a protector of the people, and a dispenser of justice. This shift in perception was likely influenced by the Canaanite fertility goddess Asherah, who was popular among the Israelites. Despite the popularity of Asherah, there was a significant theological controversy surrounding her worship. The Israelites, particularly those in the southern kingdom of Judah, were increasingly moving towards monotheism, and the worship of Asherah was seen as a threat to this emerging belief system. The Israelite prophets, such as Elijah, vehemently opposed the worship of Asherah and other Canaanite deities, leading to violent conflicts and the eventual suppression of Asherah's cult. The worship of Yahweh in ancient Israel was also influenced by the political landscape of the time. The northern kingdom of Israel was more affluent and open to syncretism, incorporating elements from various religions into their worship of Yahweh. However, this practice was heavily criticized by the southern kingdom of Judah, which was moving towards an exclusive worship of Yahweh. The destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians in 722 BCE marked a significant turning point in the worship of Yahweh. The refugees from the north were absorbed into the southern kingdom, bringing with them their syncretic religious practices. This influx of northern influences likely contributed to the further evolution of Yahweh's image and the development of unique Israelite religious practices. As the Israelites developed their community in Canaan, they sought to distance themselves from their neighbors and elevated Yahweh above the traditional Canaanite supreme deity El. However, they did not embrace monotheism at this time. The Israelites remained a henotheistic people through the time of the judges and throughout the time of the Kingdom of Israel, approximately 1080 to 722 BCE. In 931 BCE, Following the death of Solomon, 
The kingdom split in two, and a new political entity, the kingdom of Judah with its capital at Jerusalem, emerged in the south. The kingdom of Judah, nestled in the southern part of the land of Canaan, was a place where the worship of Yahweh was deeply entrenched in the fabric of society. Here, Yahweh was not just a deity to be revered. He was the cornerstone of their identity, the divine guarantor of their destiny. The Judahites saw themselves as the chosen people of Yahweh, and this belief shaped their religious practices, their political decisions, and their cultural expressions. In Judah, Yahweh was perceived as a warrior god, a protector who would defend his people against their enemies. This image of Yahweh was likely influenced by the tumultuous times in which the kingdom of Judah found itself. Surrounded by powerful empires and often caught in the crossfire of their conflicts, the Judahites looked to Yahweh for protection and deliverance. This belief in Yahweh's protective power was not just a spiritual conviction. It was a tangible reality that shaped their military strategies, their diplomatic relations, and their internal policies. The worship of Yahweh in Judah was not just a matter of personal faith. It was a state-sponsored activity. The kings of Judah, starting from David and Solomon, were seen as the earthly representatives of Yahweh. They were believed to be anointed by Yahweh himself to rule over his people. This divine endorsement gave them not just political authority, but also religious authority. They were the custodians of the Yahwistic faith, responsible for maintaining the purity of its practices and upholding its principles. However, the relationship between Yahweh and the kings of Judah was not always harmonious. There were times when the kings, swayed by political expediency or personal ambition, deviated from the path of Yahwistic faith. They introduced foreign gods into the religious landscape of Judah, allowed syncretistic practices to creep into the worship of Yahweh, and even persecuted the prophets who dared to speak against their actions. These deviations were seen as acts of apostasy, betrayals of Yahweh that invited divine punishment. In the midst of these religious upheavals, the prophets emerged as the conscience of Judah. They were the voice of Yahweh, calling the people back to the true worship of their God. They denounced the idolatrous practices, condemned the social injustices, and warned of the dire consequences of abandoning Yahweh. Their words were not always welcome, but they were necessary. They were the beacon that guided the people of Judah back to Yahweh whenever they strayed from him. The worship of Yahweh in Judah was not a static phenomenon. It was a dynamic process that evolved over time. It was shaped by the historical experiences of the people, the theological reflections of the prophets, and the political decisions of the kings. It was a faith that was deeply rooted in the past, yet constantly adapting to the present. It was a faith that was fiercely monotheistic, yet open to the influences of the surrounding cultures. It was a faith that was profoundly personal, yet inextricably linked to the collective identity of the people. In the end, the worship of Yahweh and Judah was not just about the reverence of a deity. It was about the pursuit of a divine vision. It was about the quest for a society where justice prevailed, where righteousness was upheld, and where the divine and the human were in harmonious relationship. It was about the dream of a kingdom where Yahweh reigned supreme, not just in the religious sphere, but in every aspect of life. The kingdoms of Israel and Judah periodically warred or allied with each other until 722 BCE when the Assyrians destroyed Israel and deported the inhabitants. Judah was able to withstand the Assyrian military campaigns, but only by paying tribute to Assyria. The Assyrian Empire fell to an invading force of Babylonians the absolutely earth. when the Assyrians destroyed Israel and deported the inhabitants. Judah was able to withstand the Assyrian military campaigns, but only by paying tribute to Assyria. 
the Assyrian Empire fell to an invading force of Babylonians, Medes, and others in 612 BCE, and the Babylonians claimed the region of Canaan. In 598 BCE, they invaded Judah and sacked Jerusalem, destroying the Temple of Solomon and taking the leading citizens back to Babylon. This is the time in Jewish history known as the Babylonian Captivity. Babylon was conquered by Cyrus the Great of the Persians, who allowed the Jewish leaders to return to their homeland in 538 BCE. During the Second Temple period, approximately 515 BCE to 70 CE, Judaism was revised. The Torah canonized, and a new understanding of the divine established which today is known as monotheism, the belief in a single deity. At this time, scholars have established, the older works which eventually became the Hebrew scriptures were revised to reflect a monotheistic belief system among the Israelites far earlier than was actually practiced. In this polytheistic milieu, Yahweh was initially one among many, his domain was the wilderness and the storms, and his followers were likely a nomadic group who sought his protection and guidance. But as we have seen, Yahweh's influence and stature grew over time, eventually leading to his dominance in the Israelite religious landscape. However, this transition was not a straightforward or linear process. It was a complex and dynamic evolution marked by cultural exchanges, theological debates, and socio-political changes. The early Israelites lived in close proximity to other cultures and civilizations, and their religious beliefs and practices were undoubtedly influenced by these interactions. The Canaanites, for instance, had a rich and complex pantheon of gods and goddesses, with El as the supreme deity. The influence of the Canaanite religion on the early Israelite beliefs is evident in various aspects, including the use of the name El as a generic term for God in the Hebrew Bible. However, despite these influences, the Israelites maintained a distinct identity and belief system. They recognized Yahweh as their God, and their relationship with him was marked by a unique covenantal bond. This bond was not just a religious contract, but a defining feature of their communal and individual identities. And this is because we need to consider an important transformation regarding the name of Yahweh, which until now we have only touched upon but have not delved into. The fact that the name of Yahweh did not transition directly from polytheism to monotheism. Before that, it was revered within the context of henotheism. In the early days of the Israelite civilization, polytheism was the norm. The Israelites, like their Canaanite neighbors, worshipped a pantheon of gods, each with their unique domains and responsibilities. Yahweh, in this context, was one among many, albeit a significant one. However, as the Israelite society evolved, so did their religious beliefs. The shift from polytheism to henotheism marked a significant turning point in the Israelites' spiritual journey. Henotheism, a term coined by the renowned scholar Max Muller, refers to the worship of a single god while not denying the existence or possible worship of other deities. In the context of ancient Israel, this meant that while the Israelites acknowledged the existence of other gods, they chose to worship Yahweh exclusively. This shift was not abrupt, but rather a gradual process influenced by various socio-political factors. The Israelites' transition to henotheism can be traced back to their interactions with neighboring civilizations. As they came into contact with different cultures and religious practices, the Israelites began to question their polytheistic beliefs. The worship of multiple gods, each with their distinct domains, seemed increasingly chaotic and disorganized. In contrast, the concept of a single supreme deity offered a sense of order and unity. Yahweh, with his strong association with the Israelites and his growing prominence in their religious practices, naturally emerged as the chosen deity. 
The Israelites began to view Yahweh not just as their God, but as the supreme God, superior to all others. This marked the beginning of their transition to Henoth. Buy another pair of glasses until you've seen what this new invention for this shift was not without its challenges. The Israelites had to reconcile their new belief in Yahweh's supremacy with their traditional polytheistic practices. This led to a unique blend of beliefs and practices. While Yahweh was revered as the supreme God, elements of polytheism persisted. For instance, the Israelites continued to acknowledge the existence of other gods, albeit in a diminished capacity. And that leads us to an important question. How does a god like Yahweh, a warrior god, just one among many others worshipped in those regions, become the only one and true god? In the ancient texts and inscriptions, we find intriguing clues that hint at this transformation. The ancient Israelites, who once revered a pantheon of deities, gradually began to focus their worship on Yahweh. This shift was not abrupt, but a gradual process that unfolded over centuries. When we delve deeper into the gradual process and transformation, we find evidence of alterations in the sacred texts. There were attempts to suppress the earlier beliefs, to erase the traces of the past. One such instance is found in the ancient texts where Asherah, a goddess who was once revered alongside Yahweh, was systematically removed from the religious narrative. The texts that once referred to Asherah as the consort of Yahweh were altered, reducing her to a mere sacred pillar or a wooden image. Yet the original texts tell a different story. In Deuteronomy 33, we find a passage that speaks of Yahweh coming from Sinai, accompanied by a divine presence. The original Hebrew text suggests that this divine presence was none other than Asherah. This revelation, though suppressed in later texts, provides a glimpse into the henotheistic beliefs of the ancient Israelites, and more than that, give us an attestation of the polytheistic structure of the biblical records and scriptures. Later in history, the monotheism of the Hebrew scriptures would be appropriated by the adherents of Christianity, who would continue veneration of Yahweh, eventually known as Jehovah, by Christian monks and is commonly used today. The character and power of Yahweh were codified following the Babylonian captivity of the 6th century BCE and the Hebrew scriptures were canonized during the Second Temple period approximately 515 BCE to 70 CE, to include the concept of a Messiah whom Yahweh would send to the Jewish people to lead and redeem them. Yahweh as the all-powerful creator, preserver, and redeemer of the universe was then later developed by the early Christians as their God who had sent his son Jesus as the promised Messiah and Islam interpreted this same deity as Allah in their belief system. And finally, after the entire historical and theological journey we have undertaken, an important question concludes our journey in this video. Why do we venerate this biblical entity, forged in the depths of history, as a singular God? Why do we, as a society, continue to offer thanks, seek favors, and sing praises to this God? Perhaps we need courage to dive deeper within ourselves and understand who or what the gods are that hide behind the so-called sacred scriptures. This topic is essential for those who want to study in depth, and not superficially, the subject of the Anunnaki and the theory of ancient aliens. Understanding that Yahweh was never a single god, but was transformed into a single god throughout history is fundamental for observing the extraterrestrial influence on the development of our civilization. At the end of this video, I want to invite you to realize that the evolution of Yahweh from a god among others to become the sole god revered worldwide happened through two paths. The first one, from a human perspective. As we have been studying during this video, the shift from polytheism to monotheism in ancient Israel is a complex and gradual process that likely spanned several centuries. 
In the late Bronze Age, polytheism was the norm, and various deities were associated with powerful cities. Israel, for example, had its national god, Yahweh, but acknowledged a pantheon of deities, much like the other ancient Near Eastern states. There are numerous references to an assembly of deities consisting of both gods and goddesses, presided over by one deity who was the head of the pantheon. As time passed, the perception of Yahweh began to change, transitioning from one of the gods to the head of the pantheon. In this phase, there was still no denial of the existence of other deities, but Yahweh assumed a more dominant role. This marks the beginning of a slow transition towards monotheism, where Yahweh was recognized as the national god of Israel, but other deities were increasingly considered non-entities, mere shams made of wood or stone. Eventually, the concept of monotheism was affirmed, and Yahweh alone was recognized as God. It's critical to remember that this transition was not a straightforward or sudden event. It involved a slow and complex process of reinterpretation and recontextualization of religious beliefs and practices over time. This gradual shift can be seen as a human-driven process, with changes in social, political, and cultural contexts playing a significant role. The second path, or the second perspective that I would like to present to you, and perhaps it is the fundamental one regarding the studies proposed in the videos of this channel, is the theological transition of Yahweh to become the sole God. In reality, it is not the transition from a human perspective, but from the perspective of the gods themselves. If in the ancient aliens theory we understand aliens as real physical entities that visited our ancient past, we need to observe how one of them became the only and powerful God. We even need to question whether Yahweh was the name of a specific entity or perhaps a denomination for a specific group of individuals. Therefore, we need to draw a connection between Yahweh, His name, and representation and our main subject of study on this channel, the Anunnaki. This is because in all the regions where the name of Yahweh, El, Asherah, and other gods appeared, it is exactly the same regions where the Anunnaki appeared and were revered as gods. And in this case, we are not discussing anything related to the ancient aliens theory, but rather the historical and social perspective of those ancient civilizations. But now, Evolving in this analysis based on the accounts from the gods themselves, we need to quickly explore the similarities between some of the most well-known Anunnaki entities and the characteristics of Yahweh himself. In future videos, we will do this in a more specific and detailed manner. Yahweh, in the earliest biblical literature, is portrayed as a typical ancient Near Eastern divine warrior leading the heavenly army. He was a violent war god. Over time, he was promoted as the supreme god over all others in the pantheon. Yahweh was later seen as the creator of the cosmos and the true god of the entire world. The powers of blessing and salvation were fully embedded in Yahweh, and his will was communicated via oracle and prophetic vision or audition. Yahweh was, in essence, a father god. Let's now examine the Anunnaki gods Enki, Enlil, and Ninurta, and their similarities with Yahweh. Enlil, known as the god of weather and war, was considered the king of lands and the father of the gods. His actions in Sumerian mythology mirror some aspects of Yahweh. For example, Enlil tried to exterminate humans by sending a flood, a narrative that parallels the biblical story of Noah's Ark. Although many people associate Yahweh to Enlil, when we go deeper, we understand that this assumption may not be possible. The contrast between Yahweh and Enlil becomes even more pronounced when considering Yahweh's distinct attribute as a warrior. In the scriptures, Yahweh is depicted as a fierce warrior, akin to a hero marching into battle. Isaiah 42.13 echoes this sentiment by stating, Yahweh goes forth like a warrior, like a hero. He whips up his rage, he shall roar and cry out, and over his enemies he shall prevail. Furthermore, the Song of Miriam in Numbers chapter 15 proclaims, 
A warrior is Yahweh. The Bible consistently portrays Yahweh as the Lord of hosts, emphasizing his role as a commanding leader of a formidable army. Isaiah 13.4 boldly declares, Yahweh the Lord of hosts, a warring army command. How to stop wasting money. The Mesopotamian records lack any indications or suggestions of Enlil possessing such a warrior-like image. But what about Enki? Enki, the god of knowledge, sciences, and hidden metals, possessed a unique combination of biological and mineralogical expertise. His mastery extended to the establishment of mining operations in southeastern Africa, making him the ultimate authority in that realm. These attributes closely aligned with those ascribed to Yahweh, the biblical deity. Proverbs affirmed that wisdom and understanding emanated from Yahweh's mouth, drawing a parallel to Enki's bestowal of unparalleled wisdom upon the wise Adapa. Yahweh himself declared ownership over gold and silver, while promising to grant treasures from dark and secret places. This intriguing passage can be read on Haggai 2, 8. The story of the deluge serves as a prime example of the convergence between Mesopotamian and biblical narratives. In the Mesopotamian accounts, Enki takes extraordinary measures to warn Zusudra, his loyal follower, about the impending catastrophe. He provides precise instructions for building an ark, saving animal life, and ensuring the survival of humanity. In the Bible, it is Yahweh who fulfills these roles. Further evidence supporting the identification of Yahweh with Enki emerges when examining Enki's domains. According to Mesopotamian texts, Enki received dominion over Africa after the division of earth between the Enlilites and the Enkiites. The Apsu, the region renowned for its gold mines, became Enki's primary abode alongside the city of Eridu in Sumer. We propose that the biblical term Apse Eretz often translated as the ends of the earth, refers to this distant land, southern Africa to be precise. It is in this place, Apsei Eretz, that Yahweh is said to exercise judgment and will rule upon Israel's restoration. Consequently, Yahweh can be equated with Enki in his role as the ruler of the Apsu. The similarities between Enki and Yahweh become more pronounced, perhaps even uncomfortable for the monotheistic Bible. When we encounter a passage in the book of Proverbs that exalts Yahweh's unsurpassed greatness through rhetorical questions. These questions touch upon divine acts such as ascending and descending from heaven, capturing the wind in one's hands, and binding waters as if with a cloak. Most crucially, the passage inquires about the one who established the Apsi Eretz and asks for the name of this entity and that of their son if such knowledge can be obtained. In Mesopotamian sources, Enki allocated the Apsu to his son Nurgle. The polytheistic flavor of asking about the ruler's name and that of their offspring can only be explained by inadvertently retaining a passage from the Sumerian original texts. This is akin to the earlier occurrence of us in phrases like, let us make the Adam and let us come down in the Tower of Babel story. In Proverbs 34, the gloss substitutes Yahweh for Enki. So, was Yahweh essentially Enki garbed in biblical Hebrew attire? It would be overly simplistic to assert so. Examining the tale of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden reveals that while it is the Nahash, the serpent manifestation of Enki as the knower of biological secrets, who initiates Adam and Eve's acquisition of sexual knowledge necessary for procreation, he does not represent Yahweh. Instead, he serves as an antagonist to Yahweh, paralleling Enki's relationship with Enlil. In the Sumerian texts, Enlil coerces Enki into transferring some of the newly created primitive workers intended for gold mining in the Apsu to Eden in Mesopotamia, where they engage in farming and shepherding. In the Bible, it is Yahweh who places Adam in the Garden of Eden to tend and maintain it. Yahweh, not the serpent, assumes the role of the master of Eden, conversing with Adam and Eve, discovering their transgressions and expelling them. In all these aspects, the Bible equates Yahweh not with Enki, but with Enlil, 
Ninurta, son of Enlil, was revered as the god of agriculture, hunting, and war. His role in the epic poem Lugale shows him slaying a demon and using stones to build the Tigris and Euphrates rivers for irrigation. He is seen as a protector, much like Yahweh is in the Bible. Moreover, Ninurta's depiction as a formidable warrior deity, particularly beloved by the Assyrians, aligns with the representation of Yahweh as a divine warrior leading the heavenly army. Another intriguing parallel between Ninurta and the Biblical Lord emerges from an inscription discovered during the reign of Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian king who once invaded Elam. In this inscription, Ninurta is referred to as the mysterious god who lingers in a secret place where no one can see what his divine being is about. The notion of an unseen god brings to mind the enigmatic nature often associated with the biblical lord. However, it is important to note that Ninurta was not regarded as a deity in hiding by the earlier Sumerians, and depictions of him were not uncommon. Yet, as we explore the Yahweh-Ninurta connection further, we encounter a significant ancient text that sheds light on a momentous event, challenging the notion that Ninurta and Yahweh are one and the same. This particular text deals with a striking and unforgettable occurrence, whose specific details seem to indicate that Ninurta could not have been Yahweh. One of the most pivotal actions attributed to Yahweh in the Bible with far-reaching consequences and enduring memories, is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The event is recounted in Mesopotamian texts as well, allowing for a comparison of the deities involved. In the book of Genesis, chapter 19, Sodom and Gomorrah, cities situated in the lush plain south of the Sea of Salt, are depicted as wicked. Yahweh descends from his abode and, accompanied by two angels, visits Abram and his wife Sarai in their encampment near Hebron. After predicting that the elderly couple will have a son, Yahweh dispatches the two angels to Sodom to assess the extent of the city's sinfulness. Yahweh then informs Abram that if their sins are confirmed, the cities and their inhabitants will be destroyed. Abram pleads with Yahweh to spare Sodom if at least 50 righteous individuals are found within its walls. Yahweh agrees to the plea, after Abram successfully bargains the number down to ten, and departs. The angels, having witnessed the city's wickedness, warn Lot to take his family and flee. Lot requests permission to seek refuge in the mountains, and the angels consent, delaying the imminent destruction. Ultimately, the fateful doom of the cities is set in motion, as Yahweh rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah sulfurous fire, coming from Yahweh from the skies, and he upheavaled those cities and the whole plain and all the inhabitants thereof, and all that which grew upon the ground. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before Yahweh, and gazed in the direction of Sodom and Gomorrah, toward the land of the plain, and he beheld vapor arising from the earth as the smoke of a furnace. In Mesopotamian annals, this very event is extensively documented as the climax of Marduk's struggle to establish supremacy on earth. The Mesopotamian text explicitly attributes the upheaval of the sinful cities to Nergal, not Ninurta. Considering that the Bible asserts that it was Yahweh himself who unleashed the destruction upon the cities rather than the two angels sent to investigate, it becomes clear that Yahweh cannot be equated with Ninurta. In his book, Divine Encounters, Zechariah Sitchin grapples with the enigma of Yahweh's identity. In the end of the book, he wrote, The biblical suggestion that the Elohim, the gods, or the Anunnaki, had a god, seems totally incredible at first, but quite logical on reflection. At the very conclusion of our first book in the Earth Chronicles series, the twelfth planet, having told the story of the planet Nibiru, and how the Anunnaki, the biblical Nephilim, who had come to earth from it created mankind, we posed the following question. 
And if the Nephilim were the gods who created man on earth, did evolution alone on the twelfth planet create the Nephilim? Technologically advanced, capable hundreds of thousands of years before us to travel in space, arriving at a cosmological explanation for the creation of the solar system and, as we begin to do, to contemplate and understand the universe. The Anunnaki must have pondered their origins and arrived at what we call religion, their religion, their concept of God. Who created the Nephilim, the Anunnaki, on their planet? The Bible itself provides the answer. Yahweh, it states, was not just a great God, a great king over all of the Elohim, Psalms 95.3. He was there on Nibiru before they had come to be on it. Just as the Anunnaki had been on earth before the Adam, so Yahweh on Nibiru, Olam before the Anunnaki. The Creator preceded the created. In other words, Sitchin suggests that Yahweh is not an Anunnaki, but the divine entity worshipped by them. With all due respect to Zechariah Sitchin, I disagree with this view. And why? Well, the answer is very simple. You can understand the reason by re-watching this video. The name Yahweh appears to be not unique. It is mentioned all over the place. Yahweh is depicted as a warrior god. And for me, warrior gods do not align with the qualities of a divine, pure, infinite, and loving god. You can gain a deeper understanding of my reasons by watching the previously published video, The Trial of God. Now, let's return to our previous reflection to conclude this video. We have analyzed both perspectives surrounding the name Yahweh, the historical perspective from the human point of view, and the perspective of the gods themselves. These two different perspectives, these two paths of observation, the historical perspective and the perspective of the gods themselves, demonstrate the complexity of the subject and the interconnection that can be observed. Furthermore, we can also understand why the Anunnaki topic is so threatening, and the theory of ancient aliens can shatter the religious perceptions of a large part of the world. In general, our religions do not teach us the connection with the divine that dwells in all things. They do not encourage us to observe the divine in a waterfall, on a beach, on a mountain, in the stars, in the cosmos, in death and life, in joy, as well as in sadness and anger. Of course, this is my own idea, but I observe God and His divine essence in everything. Religion, on the contrary, teaches us that God is present only through that specific entity, and that entity is distant in the heavens, observing our actions, punishing and threatening us, even though He, the all-powerful God, love us. For me, the real search for the divine begins within ourselves and in the search for who is the God that speaks deeply within our being when we focus on ourselves. For me, the true religion is our inner self connected to the totality. And Yahweh, well, Yahweh, like other gods, deserves reverence for what they did in our past. They helped develop our civilization, our culture, shaped our bodies and allowed life. And then... That's it. Let us not allow ourselves to worship any external entity beyond our own divine self. Well, what did you think? Um, did it uh, strike you? Did you see the parallels from the Bible? This video I went back, this is my third or fourth time I've watched this video and each time I watch it I get something different. Now, I've been looking at, uh, if this subject interests you, I've been on the site and they have uh, 44 videos in total. And there's some really interesting uh, titles. Uh, the Trial of God, Was He Invented? I'm halfway through that one. And like I said before, all of the movies, there's a movie one, two, three, four. It's really good to get the whole idea of the Anunnaki, who they were, the, the tablets and and what the history on Earth shows in connection uh, with this alien race. Now, when I, when I call it a, an alien race, 
you know, if it's if it's the same DNA as us, and that's what you'll find as you go through this, is the DNA, just like we're created in God's image, well, they are the God of Adam, and they needed a bunch of workers. Uh, they needed gold. They're the planet Nibiru is, is the 12th planet, and it has an oblong or orbit, and it orbits every 3,600 years. And on the planet, uh, they have volcanoes and uh, different things that build uh, an atmosphere that heat the planet. Now, being that this planet orbits every 3,600 years, um, one orbit is their year, and they call it a char. And uh, so a char is 3,600 years. And then the, uh, the Anunnaki that went with Noah, or there's another name for Noah, but went across the uh, ark or across the waters that was amazing and you'll get that in the story because he um, traveled with Noah he had this they had uh, all the DNA for all the animals so it was done with DNA it makes sense the Noah's story the ark story makes sense now because of this advanced alien race and this one God wanted to protect humanity so um, so he came with Noah and helped them get started uh, after after the flood. Now the reason of the flood is because this planet Nibiru came around and it caused the ice shelves to break off on the on the poles and there was a separation and this caused a huge flood on the earth that time that it passed around. And that's the only time that I know that this happened. I don't know if this planet keeps coming around every 3600 years or I went online and, and asked NASA, you know, just googled it do they know about it? They say they can't see it, but there's lots of stuff they can't see out there that, that has, uh, that's a way out in the asteroid belt. So through this movie or through this uh, documentary series, I, I've learned a lot about our asteroid belt, where that is and what made up the asteroid belt. And that there was a, at one time there was a planet, a fifth planet that crashed into another planet or moon or our moon or our earth even and it created this asteroid belt <clears throat> so i have a lot to learn i'm going to watch it all again because it's just kind of a starting place for me so i hope you guys online uh, the comments uh, join in uh, with the comments i uh, appreciate you guys uh, coming in on this premiere and it's a chance that we as a community can look into this i this stuff and and step outside of the box and really take a look at it i find it fascinating and interesting and what I find interesting, too, is the fact that, uh, you know, maybe they did doctor the Bible over hundreds of years. Because it wasn't just one guy that had an idea. Like Rutherford and Russell, those were one guyers. And you think of it, they started it, and it's over 150 years that the Watchtower has doctored the Bible themselves in the last 150 years. So why wouldn't uh, a nation like Israel that was trying to po politically pull people together, why could they not make it so that there was one God and try to make one God the most powerful? And, and of course, every nation makes their God the best all over the earth. Everyone wants their God to be the most powerful. And isn't that why we've had all the conflicts all these years? So maybe this is our awakening. Maybe we're waking up. And we're realizing that all of these religions on earth are all a little bit off. They're a little bit narcissistic with their own thinking and making everyone making their gods superior for political reasons. So there's lots for us to think about as we wake up outside of religion. And now we can take a look inside, take a look at history, take a look at other things out there. Uh, and, and where did the Bible come from? That was one of my biggest questions. Where did the Hebrew scriptures come from? We know that the Romans had a lot to do with the, the New Testament and shaping it to control people. So what happened with the Old Testament? Well, it kind of looks like it could be the same. So there's some good videos here. Yahweh exposed the Anunnaki movies. And, um, and really uh, some good information just to get us thinking, thinking about our own spirituality. What about our own inner self, our own thoughts inside? Are they not important? Or are we going to put all of our trust 
in some other guy, some other guy thousands of years ago that was following a god that we don't even know what that god is about. But now we kind of know a little bit more about what the god of Yahweh was really about and how Yahweh was this storm god originally and part of a pantheon. So for me, that was an awakening. That was brand new. And as I learn more, I will share more on my channel. So thank you everyone for joining us today on the Saturday Sex Show and Anaki to Yahweh. And this may be the start of a new learning. So thanks again. And here is our conclusion. Here we go. Now I'm going to take my mic off. I'll leave it on here. But I'm going to take my desktop audio off. There we are. So here's our conclusion. So until next time, keep living your life with love. Bye for now. Well, it looks like my ride's here, so uh, anyway, I ride home.